Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the PODS Fundamental Training Series. I'm Kathy Mayo, the Executive Director. With me is Julie Parker. I think you're all familiar with her. She's our trainer for this series and I think has done just a really fine job. Um, we've got a packed day today. Uh, we, I went over the slides yesterday with her and just a lot of meaty content. So again, welcome. I'd like to thank our sponsor, uh, Petro IT. Thank you, Petro IT, for uh, making this happen. And our principal sponsor, Esri. Before we get started, I want to um, talk to you about where we are in this in this schedule. Today is Unit Four, and next week, as you know, we are um, not going to have training uh, for think for the U.S. Uh, holiday of Thanksgiving, and then we're going to um, commence the following. Tuesday, which is December 1st. That'll be unit five. Then we're going to skip a week. And some of you who enrolled may have seen that you got a cancellation notice for that unit. So that unit is actually going to um, take place on December 15th. So everything just rolled forward by a week. And you should have received those notices. Those of you who are not enrolled yet for December 1st and December 15th, please go to our website and sign up for um, Unit 5, which is um, uh, Utility Network, and then our final um, wrap-up session for Unit 6, December 15th. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Okay, let me um, give you presenter control. All right, so let's get the presentation going. Can you see the presentation? Um, we're having the issue again where oh, it, there, yeah. I think we're good. Uh, are you good? It does bleed off a bit on the left side. Hmm. Let me see if we take it, if we go down one more, does it, good? No, we're cut off on the right side. And if I recall, um, I need, I can't, it goes, it goes to full screen mode. How do I fix that part? Can you see the text though on this? Gosh, um, the left hand side. Again, I'm gonna ask out there if anybody listening. Oh, hold on a second. Has a fix. I need to um, change my sharing. I think that's the problem. Show presenter view. Let me end the show. I had it. Um, I want to be able to share. Sorry. You could see my full slide now, right? With the speaker notes? That's right. Okay. Yes, that's right. Now, if I do this, do you see that? It's cut off. We used to not have any problems with this, and now all of a sudden, I think that when I upgraded, it just got messed up. I'm looking for other options here. Ah, oh, here we go. Let me see if this will work. The previous was better. Yeah, I'm trying to get it to let me show the PowerPoint presentation itself and not just the slide. That's the problem. But I can't get back to the sharing permissions. So no one clicked to start screen sharing. All right, so now I want to decide what I want to share.
I'm so sorry, you guys. Here. How's that? Perfect. Huh. I think I figured out. I, I started doing this a different way, and I think that's the problem. So I need to go back to what I did successfully in the beginning. So let's move through this introductory stuff. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so sorry for bumbling around here. This is going to be a really good session this time. As, as, as you heard uh, Kathy say, it's a pretty meaty um, topic this time, and there's there's a lot of good stuff in it. And uh, please, uh, if you're just joining us on this web series, please hit uh, your website for pods.org to download this session if you want to go through it again, because it does have quite a bit of content in it. And certainly not just this one is available, but some of the other ones are too. So this, technically is called unit four modifying and extending pod seven but really what it's what its purpose is is to answer the question where does my data go so i am contemplating a pod seven implementation and i need to understand how am I going to map my data over? What What is it that's going to help me get to where I need to be with pod seven? And that's really what this topic is, is about. It's answering that central question about where does my data go? So we are, let's see, we are in unit four. As I mentioned before, we have two more units left, so we won't bore you with that detail. Kathy talked about that already. So let me just review real quick with you. Last time we were together, we talked about the three different types of models that are associated with a pod's implementation. So this was just a quick review of conceptual, log logical, and physical models. The conceptual model is like the pod seven poster that we looked at last week, where we see the, the concepts, we see the data, the entities that are represented by the model, and we see the connections and relationships between them. But we don't have um, all the concreteness of, of the next model, which is the logical model. So the concept is, is your idea, I'm going to go back to my house plan idea, I've got a set of, of drawings from my house that I'm going to build, and it's great for me, I can see where the rooms are and stuff, and I can see how the living room and the dining room are related, and the kitchen, but I need more information, and certainly my builder is going to need a lot more information to go on before he starts building this house. So the logical model is akin to that, that drawing set of plans. It has the wiring diagram in it. It has the plumbing diagrams in it. It has the, the actual measurements and sizes of, of the windows and door openings, and et cetera. So by the time we're at the logical model phase, this is actually taking that concept and moving towards making it real. So now we're starting to put a lot more details in between the entities that were being represented in the model. Lastly, the physical model is where we have the physical implementation in whatever particular schema or whatever particular relation, relational database management system you happen to be in. So it's going to be the physical manifestation of the conceptual and logical model, i.e., back to my example, I've got a set of drawing plans and technical drawing plans, and at the end of this, I really hope to have a physical model of the house itself. So I won't go through each and every one of these, but this is going to go through a little bit more detail for those of you that, that didn't catch this last time. We're just talking in more detail about um, fleshing out the conceptual and logical models, but I'd like to move us along this morning so we can get into some of the other meaty things. So in this particular 
presentation this time. We're talking about not just implementing and extending pod seven. You're actually moving at this stage from the conceptual and logical philosophies of pod seven, and you're moving towards the physical implementation of it. And so this is going to be more grounded then in the reality of the, the relational database management system that you work in and your environment. So we're also going to be talking about um, the flexibility of the pods data model. You can see how extensible and how flexible this model is so that you can, can then be assured that you're going to be able to make it fit your specific needs for your organization. We're also going to talk about a concept called modules. We talked a little bit about them last time. We're going to go a little deeper this time into modules, but modules are the way, they're the vehicle through which we're going to extend pod seven. And then lastly, we'll bring it on home with where does my data go with that question being answered. So our goals then for this particular unit are to gain the exposure you need to, to the higher level models of pod seven, the logical and the physical, making the, the paper drawing become the physical implementation. We're going to understand more about how Pod 7 can be implemented, how you can make it flex to your organizational needs by extending the model with your own modules. Lastly, um, we're going to also focus on making sure that you have a firm foundation and understanding where your data goes and not just where it goes, but how it gets there. So you'll recall last time, this diagram shows the schema of pod seven. It incorporates the conceptual, but it also has some of the logical model elements in it because you can see that the, the relationships and tables and information um, provided along with the conceptual are giving you more of the logical nature in the model. You're able to understand a lot more about the relationships between all of the relational databases and elements of this particular conceptual model. So they, they actually say that the, the poster is a, a both a conceptual as well as a logical representation of pod seven. So remember from last time, we, we kind of took each section of the conceptual logical model and we described what, what each of these sections were. We talked about the bottom of this poster. If this is the first time you're seeing it, for those of you that are just, just joining us, if you do nothing else first, the very first thing you need to do is to read the text at the bottom of this poster because A, it will help you understand what's going on, but it also um, helps explain some of the concepts that are, that are uh, used in the model and help you begin seeing the connections between the data elements. What's important for you to know at this point is that each block of, of, of the poster here and the color coding along with it is indicating the presence of uh, different relational databases. The colors associated with each one of those tables indicates what kind of table it is, what kind of feature or geometry that's represented by it. And then the icons in the table further indicate the geometric representation of records in the table. Typically, these are rows in a table, points, lines, and polygons as, as some of your feature classes too. You'll also remember from last time, I mentioned that uh, if you were to download the poster, you would see the green circles with the L in them. And that is designating that these modules or these sections are present in the pods light model, which is, is very, very similar to pod seven. It's certainly not the full data model, but if you want to kick the tires, so to speak, on pod seven, you can certainly download pod seven light. 
And so you'll see on the conceptual diagrams that you download, you'll see those green L's. And so I just wanted you to remember what those were. So we have discussed then the conceptual, logical, and physical models. Let's move forward. I want to look at a different organizational aspect of pod seven in this unit. Um, I want us to talk about the other parts that make up the pod seven, the documentation portion, the enterprise architect portion, the shape change portion and the metadata portion. These are other aspects of the pod seven model that you need to know something about before you jump in. So let's take these one by one. The documentation model, I, I would say this is your best friend. This is gonna be your best friend for implementing pod seven or upgrading to pod seven. And, and as a new person coming into to the pod seven world, I can tell you by reading the documentation, it's so well written, it's such high quality and, and very thorough, right down to giving you step-by-step -step instructions and screenshots um, to help you with certain aspects of, of uh, your implementation. And I just can't, can't give enough kudos for the quality of the documentation. It will be your saving grace through all of this. It's very high quality, and I hope that you check it out very early in your exploration of pod seven. So you'll notice um, many of these documents we might have mentioned last time, and if you are joining us for the first time, the user documents that you download with the model will contain this documentation that you see before you, as well as many other documents. Read them thoroughly and rely on them because they are definitely reliable and something that, that you're gonna need step-by-step -step instructions for. So the documentation portion then is, is just all the general information, um, also some scripts, the data dictionaries that explain all the different types of data and their functions and purposes and definitions are also part of this documentation. Um, you'll also see um, a general executive summary on pod seven, and then you'll also see updates that have been made, any changes that have been made to the model and so on. So. Documentation is certainly one of the most key aspects of the model. So the enterprise architect, I don't know if, if you're familiar with this or not, but this is Spark's system enterprise architect. It is a visual modeling and design tool. It's, it's based on um, OMG UML. So UML is, is a very universal type of, of, of platform or language. So the platform supports the design and construction of software systems and also models for business processes and also you know, various industry specific domains. It's used very widely through business and organizations to not just model the architecture of their systems, but also to process um, the implementation of these models across the full application lifecycle. So it's key to, to having this for pods because it's what allows pods to have basically one model serve many different installations or many different physical models. So you recall way back at the beginning of this, we talked about the fact that, that you can download pods and that there is a model, there's over 20 some odd different implementations of pod seven that can be configured in order to fit the various organizations based upon what your relational database management system is. So it may be SQL, it may be Esri Arc GIS, it may be something different, maybe Oracle. So the important part to know about this is then that the enterprise architect is, is really what allows 
pods to offer one basic type of model that can be deployed to match up with different implementations. We call that an implementation pattern. So we, we talked about that briefly in our first session, but if you don't know what that means, an implementation pattern is just a method for implementing pods. Um, that includes the database and the spatial data storage and management protocols that are keyed to whatever database system you happen to be on. So the next one, the next module is the shape change module. And shape change is interesting because it's a Java tool. These are, are open source um, pieces that, that are, are coming together to work in pods. So this is a Java tool and it takes application schemas that are constructed to a particular level of ISO UML model. It derives the implementation representation. So shape change directly interfaces with the enterprise architect and those models then um, once the, those are, are accessed, the models become available to be implemented and created as Oracle instances or SQL or Esri or XML. So if you're seeing a trend here, these options here, these, these different models that we're talking about or modules that we're talking about are things that are helping pods fit into many different implementation patterns. So of course, metadata, data about your data is very important here and is a very important module. It, um, the metadata, of course, is contained. There's, there is certainly going to be metadata about the tables, the attributes, a lot of the code lists and domain lists that, that we have in the model, and certainly um, code lookup cross-references and the like. So the metadata module then loads the tables, the attributes, the code lookups, and so on, um, and all the enumerations, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, it, it is responsible for describing the base level implementation of all of these minor things, or not so minor actually, they're, they're pretty important in terms of describing what is, is in your model and the data and domains and their associated values. So this is a key document that you're gonna need to make your best friend. This is the Logical Modeling and Physical Implementation Guide. This is one of the documents that is going to be unzipped or it's in the container containing all the zip documents for pod seven. This is the one that you're gonna to wanna to get really friendly with because it is your, your document for, for implementing pod seven. It has the instructions you need. It has all the information on all these, these uh, additional uh, models that we just talked about, or, or I hate to call them models, but e each one of these um, entities that we just talked about are more fully described in this document. So it is also keyed to various uh, physical implementation patterns. So you're going to find information that's going to fit your particular need here. But this is your key document that you're gonna need to use. So at this point, we're gonna focus now on implementing and extending pods. We've talked then about the, the other types of, of sections that are in the pods model. We've talked about the, the, the logical and the physical side of, of the pods model, but now we wanna delve a little bit deeper into how to implement it and extend it. So um, as you know, I've, I've said before, the pod seven is very extensible, it's very adaptable, and it can be used to generate several different implementations depending on whatever relational database management system you have. Super important thing to remember. So 
one of the things that, that comes along then with um, beginning to, to populate data into pods is the classes and attributes, enumerations, and code lists. And that's where we're going to turn our attention to next. So what you'll find is, is that these items that we're talking about are, are data integrity enhancements that, that have been the, uh, I guess, the, the most, one of the most important functions of the pods models throughout history, not just in pod seven. There's been data integrity enhancements in, in the previous versions as well. Pod seven is certainly no exception. The addition of code lists and pod seven data model though is a good example of continued strengthening of data quality and management. We're gonna take the, a look at those in deeper detail. Pod seven has a set of classes and their attributes and the related enumerations, which we're also gonna delve into, and code lists. These are required to specify the structure of the pod's content. Code lists are managed in the pod seven logical model. These are kind of like lookup tables. The logical model supports domains for geodatabase implementations. Code lookup tables um, will be what you would use for SQL, DDL implementations and code lists for the XML schema data change spe specifications. Code list values and the descriptions are typically synonymous. So let's dive into code list. What is a code list? So these code lists are actually ways, uh, uh, as we just mentioned, these are ways of enforcing data standards and also data integrity. And so these are things that are going to be populated in the model. You'll certainly be able to extend these, but you'll notice if you've worked with, with um, domains, for example, when you create a domain, you're gonna define that domain, you're gonna name it, and you're also going to list all the various potential occurrences of that data in your experience or, or in your setup. And so these code lists are very similar to that. Um, they are going to, to help define the various types of data. So for example, in this table that you see in the, the drawing, you can see that we've got the pods valve manufacturer and you can see there's a there's a code running down the left column and you can also see a description of what that code means and then there's also a status field here that whether this particular code is active or not in the particular implementation so this is a description then of data that's going to be loaded into a, a code list what you're going to find as we go further into this is that these there's going to be differences between enumerators and code lists which we're going to define next but they're all code lists i mean they're all basically doing a very similar function it's just with more or less control involved so let's talk about these code lists a little bit more We've mentioned the fact that they enforce data integrity and standardization, but the one thing I didn't mention is the data entry aspect. I bet you, you can think about databases in your own organization and you can see company name typed in several different ways. It might be in all caps, it might be all in lowercase, it might be in proper case, et cetera. So, What's happening with code list then is it's helping to ease data entry by providing default choices as people are maybe out in the field collecting data or they're, they're entering data in the office. It helps just smooth the data entry process, make it faster and more efficient for the person entering that data. But it also on the backside provides us some trust, a trust level in the data that's being entered into the system. 
So these code lists then are, are very important to provide good data coming into your system. So um, data entry, for those of you, if you've ever been out in the field with a GPS unit or something and you're having to, to pick a, a list of options for a particular piece of equipment in the field, you've, you've experienced these before. You might be more familiar with domains, but these are the same things. They're, they're as far as data entry goes, they're providing you predetermined options for data entry. So let's talk more about the various types of code lists. Enumerations is the first type, and these are present, but they have a rather large presence excuse me, in the pods model. So pods code lists are maintained in the pods data models logical portion. It's in the logical model. Code lists store the values for certain attributes of pipeline features. These code lists are matched to the type of database or geodatabase that the data resides in. Because the values are important to the working of the PODS model standard, PODS then manages or owns the life cycle of these values. So enumerations are key to the operation of the PODS model itself. Therefore, as an end user, you won't be able to make changes to those. They can be added or retired or deprecated um, or superseded, but it would be very rare. And when it does occur, it's going to be a pods um, leadership decision. We have to keep the integrity of the pods data model such that everyone is served by it. And so changes to the model are very thoughtfully done. And when they are done, it's because there's been a lot of research and a lot of input from members before putting a change in place. So these are not managed by end users. So here's some examples of what enumerations look like. Just a, a, an idea here. You can see the various values for certain fields here. I won't go through all of these, but you get, you get the idea. You have yes and no options. Um, you want to provide additional options such as not applicable or unknown and so on. So these are enumerator examples. These are actual tables from the POD7 model. Let's move on. So the next type is what we call a managed code list. And at this level with managed code lists, all the possible values are permanently fixed when the model is standardized. So it's kind of like an enumeration. It may not be as complete though, but most of the possible values, the most commonly occurring values of particular um, fields are, are fixed when the model is standardized. So they are also important to the working of the standard. But as with enumerations, um, you are, are not at liberty to make changes as you see fit to managed code lists. They, they do change sometime, but it usually requires more of a formal process by pods membership and also um, consideration by those that are managing the model before you're going to see changes to these code lists made. So there's, there's a bit of a process then because we don't want to make uh, changes just, just without good cause and we want to make sure that, that we're doing it for the good of all the members, not just a handful. So here's some examples that you'll see in the POD7 model of managed code lists. So these are talking, um, most of these examples are pipeline assets. So you can see there is a status table, there's a pipeline system type identified, a product type identified, and so on. 
So you're probably wondering, all right, well, what do I get to do? What do I have control over? Rest assured, you have some control. Here is the unmanaged code list. The values in this list are examples. They're pre-populated, but they don't have to remain in the code list. You can change them. You can make them fit your organization. These values are not specific to the actual functioning of the pods model. Therefore, end users can change them as they need to. So you can, you can add these values, you can add values, add new values, retire other values that you don't use anymore. You can completely deprecate them, um, or you can, you can um, create new ones. So the bottom line here with unmanaged code lists, the management's being done by the pods model and the membership in the previous two examples, but in this particular case, unmanaged code list then, you have free reign with what you do. This is, this is one of those junctions at which you as an end user of, of pods or, or someone that's, that's deploying pods in the organization has some control of what your users are using in their implementation of pods. So this is where you have some control. So here's an example of an unmanaged code list. Now, some of you might, your eyes might light up when you see unmanaged, you know, but it doesn't mean that there's no management at all needed. It means that the pods model isn't managing these lists. Each organization, there should always be individuals that are designated to ensure the code lists are correct and that they're up to date. So unmanaged means it's not this, this code list or these code lists are not managed by pods. Please do, if you, as you're giving thought to implementing pods, please do think about and, and set up a, a data management structure in your organization if you don't already have one that will help uh, mediate changes to, to your implementation and to your code lists and have, have people that own certain code lists so that, that there is oversight. So that finishes up the code list portion of this presentation. Let's move on to documenting pod seven. We talked about that documentation module at the beginning of, of this particular series. And, and let's delve a little deeper into what that actually means. So there are data dictionaries that accompany pod seven, and it's not just in uh, one particular aspect. So the POT7 logical data model and the diction, excuse me, the dictionary applies to all physical implementations, regardless of the target database. So the same data is being managed in each type of implementation pattern, whether it's Oracle, SQL, SQL Server, what have you, geodatabase. So that's important to remember. You'll also know the same is holding true for metadata scripts. So let's talk about populating the model. This is where we're getting to answering the question, where does my data go? Where does data end up in the pods model and how does it get there? We introduced you last time to the idea of creation scripts. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Just execute the script and away it goes. It, 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 it implements all these, these tables with values populated. Well, it does sound a little good to be true maybe, right? So there, there is, there is data creation scripts and you will use them. However, you're gonna find in your implementation and those of you that have implemented data uh, 
mapping before, you'll see that there's rarely a one-to-one -one data correlation. Data elements rarely line up one-to-one. -one. For example, your current model might refer to a pipeline as a pipe seg, and pod seven refers to it as a pipeline. So often you'll find that you're going to be extending the pods model. You'll spend more time extending the model rather than loading it. Loading it's going to be the easy part, but extending the model and making sure that these creation scripts are, are matching up with what you're going to need in your implementation is going to be the time consuming part of it. So though the feature or the component then might be the exact same name or structure, you're usually be, you will usually be able to find or make a way to store your data. So don't lose heart if you don't see exactly the same table in your older version of pods, for example, in pod seven. There, it, there will be a way to store, there is a way to store every element of a pipeline. It's just different now. So you'll have to spend a lot of time reading this po the conceptual model poster and understanding the relationships between data, but you'll find these things. I do want to prepare you though for this, this um, process of, of trying to extend the model and making sure that your data crosses over properly. Those of you that are experienced in this know that, that data loading rarely goes smoothly the first time. There's always some gotcha out there, I call them. For example, you may see that there's a variation between text, um, a field that's stored as text and a field that's stored as numeric, for example. In that case, pods may have it defined one way, your organization may have it defined another, and even though it's the same information, the fact that it's text, there's a difference in data type is gonna prevent it from loading. So you're going to run into these kinds of situations and so it's going to take patience and it's going to take you knowing your data very well in this process and properly guiding the implementation. So how do you minimize this? I mean you're, you're not going to eliminate it but you can certainly do your homework ahead of time really get to know this model well and do your checks ahead of time so that you understand what you have in your environment versus what is depicted in the model. Look at these tables, understand the creation scripts and how they're working and do what you can ahead of time expecting that there's going to be problems. Those of you that are well experienced in data loading, you know way more about this than I do. But for those of you that might be biting this off for the first time, preparation is going to be key here. Knowing the model, understanding the data types that are associated with each level of the model, and also understanding your own data very, very well will help you smooth out. So here's just one example. This is a site structure that you see here. Oops. So you can see um, the site here is in the center. It's these top yellow boxes, yellow and gray boxes that you see here. The, this is all of the area here that's devoted to store, storage of the sites of a site. So if I look at this in pod seven, notice I've got uh, point layers for the site centroid, I have a line layer of the site layout, and then I have a polygon layer here for the site boundary. I also have various relating tables that are feeding into this particular site. So you have more information about the site itself, the site name, the type of site that it is, and a parent site ID. So there's other relationships here that, that may or may not exist in your own implementation. When I compare this then to pod seven, uh oh, somehow or another that got paused. So now you'll see with this particular structure, 
compare it then with how it actually looks. It's more linear in nature to be sure. For some reason, we're having an issue here. Hmm. Not sure what that was all about. So here's your pod site structure. Back to that again. This is what I originally wanted to show you was I wanted you to focus in on this area in red. I think that was an artifact from the first presentation that I forgot to get rid of. I'll have to make sure to do that. So you can see again, sorry, the site structure. Oh, it's doing the same thing again. So now you can see in pod six, this is where I was trying to get to. In pod six, you can now see what the site tables look like. I mean, just the physical arrangement of all these tables is completely different, but there's also way more entities here than, than what you see. And you still see some of the same types of relationships, but the site table here is going to look very different than what you would have seen in pod seven. So be patient look through these data elements, see how they're going to map over to the new session they, or to the new model. You may notice that it's not going to be a one-for-one -one match. In fact, it probably won't be, but that's okay because there are ways to fix that and ways to make it more custom to your particular situation. So how do you do that? You do that by extending the model with something we call modules. This is the primary way that you're going to extend the pods model. You are going to be free to create your own module packages that are, are containing the elements of your own data and data definitions. So you'll create your own modules and in the, the guide that we looked at previously, you're going to see instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this in your environment. But you'll create a module package and then here's where the customization comes in next. You're going to extend that model by adding your own attributes or data classes or creating and modifying elements of various code lists or even making new code lists. Or you can even add enumerations as new data associations within the pods model. So this is how you're going to extend the model. Yes, you can load data in and once you get the data mapping correct the data can be loaded in but that's probably only a fraction of what really needs to go into your pods model so modules are going to be needed then to help um, create the additional data elements for your particular organization As I mentioned before, you're going to see there's quite a bit of documentation on this. It's key. You'll see the instructions. You'll also see that there are pods model rules that go along with these instructions. And these rules are going to help make sure that you stay compliant with the model as you are developing your own, um, your own data modules and elements thereof. So, the bottom line here is that these modules are going to extend your capabilities of your pod 7 model implementation. And these, these rules and, and other um, ways of managing pods data input are doing the job of ensuring that your model is, is high quality and it also is in alignment with the pod 7 standard. So you're going to see step-by-step -step directions. You'll also see down the bottom of my screen here, if you see this rule 57, this is an example. As you are designing a table, for example, it, as part of a module, it's, it's telling you information about how to properly do that. And what the, the rules of the road are, so to speak, for doing this operation. So this documentation is going to be key to extending the model for you. Right alongside that, 
when we talk about extending the model, it's also going to be key to validate that model. And PODS also has ways of implementing and validating modules. So it's simply a matter of following the steps that you see below, and it kicks off a script that validates your particular module. So that way you have much more confidence in what you've just created. And you have the opportunity, of course, to make changes in order to have it pass the module validation. So to end then, here's the answer to our question that we began with. Where does your data go? Well, it can go into the existing pods model. It may not go in one to one. It's going to exist, it's going to require some work on extending the model. It's going to um, mean that you're also going to have to work on your data loading scripts and, and anything you need to, to match up your data that you already have with the existing model. But at the end of the day, it will find its home in pod seven. If it doesn't already have a home there, then that's when you'll create the modules that you need that will help integrate your data and your business practices into the pod seven model. So leave knowing that your data will find a home in pod seven. It's going to take some work and it's certainly not a job for one person but you will see that there is a home for everything that you need within the model. With that, I'm going to end this session. I hope that you've gotten something out of it. I hope that you're beginning to get an idea of the possibilities for your organization and also maybe feeling a little bit more comfort around the fact that you've got good documentation, you've got loads of support, and you also have people in the pods membership that you can turn to as well as pods vendors in the vendor community that you can turn to for help in this regard as well. So I hope you have enjoyed learning a little bit more about where your data goes in the pods model. Feel free to download this if you want to step through it again. And with that, Kathy, I will turn it over to you in case you have any questions. Hey, Julie, thank you. Um, we did have one question come in from uh, Carrie. And Carrie, I have asked our uh, Pod 7 designer to answer that for us, and I'll send that along to you. And, and for those of you, uh, his question was in a valve uh, code list, for example. There's a long list of valves, and can they be alphabetized? So again, for easy searching. So I'll, I'll find you that answer. <clears throat> and um, again, a lot of information here. All of these sessions are recorded. You can go to Pod's website and uh, seek the recording as well as these PowerPoints so that you can listen again through areas that you really needed to hear it one more time because there was so much information there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, with that, I would again like to thank you, Julie. Um, great information. I'd like to thank our sponsor again, uh, Petro IT and Esri. And uh, let me see if there's any other questions that have come in. No other questions. Again, I welcome you to join us in two weeks on December 1st for Unit 5, Utility Network, and then uh, we'll wait another two weeks and it'll be our final session. So I appreciate all of you joining us. And um, let me think if I had one more comment I wanted to make. Perhaps not. Um, so I think we are good. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, uh, I encourage you to sign up for our last two sessions. Um, the feedback, I want to say, has been very good. We uh, got some feedback in the chat box that um, folks indicating they've learned so much from these sessions, and I would certainly have to agree. 
uh, as we unpack um, the zipped package and, and go through that. There's so much there. Like Julie said, it should become your best friend. Um, we often turn to our logical uh, uh, conceptual model and that poster, again, your best friend and all the information in fine print at the bottom of that poster. Like I said last time, we are looking to extract that out and put it in a booklet form. And um, that too sh is a very important uh, key document. So that is found directly on POD's website. So with that, we'll conclude today's training. Um, Julie, I don't know if you have any last comments or if we're good to go. We're good to go. I just want to say thanks everyone for tuning in today. I apologize for my slide snafu. I'm going to get my act together next time. I'm not sure what happened with that, but I hope you're able to to download and, and also go through it at your yeah. leisure and soak it in a little bit more than what we have time for in our simple little one hour here. So enjoy and thanks for coming in on the call. Okay. Thank you, and all of you enjoy the rest of your week and be safe.